Well, hello, here we are. It took us a little bit of getting connected, but we are all good to go with tonight's webinar. Welcome to the approximately 1,400 people who have joined us. And uh, we have got very many more people who are watching with others and who will watch the recording, I'm sure. So MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island, Australia. So I'm Steve Trumbull. I'm Head of Medical Education at the University of Melbourne. I'm a GP by background, uh, but with um, a major interest in medical education, which is why I'm here tonight. I do work in remote Aboriginal communities, but probably not as much as I wish I could. We're obviously broadcasting during the pandemic. This is no longer a novelty, having webinars as a means of communication. It's no longer a novelty being online, at home, and particularly after hours. We're conscious that many of you will be distracted from tonight's discussion. If you have family issues and you need to leave, then please be assured that the uh, webinar is being recorded and you will be able to watch the, um, the recording afterwards. So please don't feel stressed if you feel you have to leave us tonight. But we hope you can stay. We've got a wonderful case, a great topic, and a great panel. So let's get in and, uh, and have a look. So here's the panel. I won't go through their details because you've had the chance to read about them online. So we'll skip people's bios and just introduce the speakers one by one. First of all is a GP like myself, Dr. Caroline Johnson from Victoria. Hi, Caroline. How are you? Good, thanks, Steve. Hello. Now, as a fellow GP, I'm going to ask you, how is it that uh, we know that somebody has seasonal, sorry, I was going to say seasonal affective disorder, social anxiety disorder, rather than it just being a fancy label for shyness when that person, person walks through your door? Well, it's really a great tra tragedy um, of social anxiety disorder that it often get mi gets mixed up with shyness um, and that means that access to treatment is delayed. So it takes a little bit of picking out and you've got to be very careful that families or teachers or even sometimes other health professionals don't lead you astray um, because it really can be quite a disabling condition unlike shyness which is a personality trait that many people learn to live with without too much distress at all. Well, certainly the case we're looking at tonight, Anne-Marie's got lots going on somatically as well. I think we'd have to say that it would be a misdiagnosis uh, in her case. So we'll talk about that not too far away. So also in Victoria, like Caroline and I, Wessex, is Catherine Madigan. Now, Catherine, you're a psychologist, so welcome. Why is this Thank form you. of anxiety in particular important to discuss? Well, it certainly can have profound effects on people's lives if it's left undiagnosed or misdiagnosed or untreated. Uh, people are more likely to be depressed, more likely to be single, and if you don't want to be single, that's an issue. Um, sufferers are less likely to be employed. Uh, they have a lower overall level of um, academic attainment. You know, they're more likely to drop out of school or university courses and obviously it can affect their employment prospects and the kinds of jobs um, they might do. So they'll avoid jobs with social interaction. Certainly not a trivial condition at all. So uh, that's why we're focusing on tonight, why I've got such a good turn up of participants. And also to welcome Lisa, Lisa Lumpe. Now you're a psychiatrist up around Newcastle area and you were involved in the development of the College of Psychiatrists practice guidelines for the treatment of panic disorder, social anxiety disorder and also generalised anxiety disorder. Do you see those guidelines being used by practitioners in day-to-day -day clinical practice? Look, I would hope so because one of the things that we deliberately did when we put together those uh, guidelines to have a a section up front which provides key facts in three pages and then academics or people that want to read the nitty-gritty of all the references can read the body of the text further along but we really wanted to provide a user-friendly summary right up front people can use in day-to-day -day practice. Fantastic well great to have that. I just need to introduce people now to the webinar platform. Those of you who have been here before will be familiar with it. I wanted to point out a few features of it. 
First of all, there's the chat box at the purple button there where you can uh, talk to us through the chat. So please make sure you're talking with each other. Looks like people are getting on board there and explaining where they're from and also uh, some of the things that they're interested in particularly. I'll try and keep an eye on that through the night. If things are popping up that you want the panel to address, we'll certainly do that. However, you can also ask more formal questions. And there's a question manager box there, and we do have a couple of questions being asked all, already. So we will be also covering off on some of the questions that were submitted when you registered for the webinar. So please, if you have a question that you'd like to ask tonight, pop it in the question box, which is the blue button there. Slides and resources, the slide set that you'll be looking at tonight is available uh, with the light blue button and also the cases there if you haven't had a chance to read it as yet. There is a friendly help button, which is always good news. So click on that if you have anything that you're struggling with and you'll be connected to the conference providers. There's also a phone number you can call, which I, I won't read out now, but I'll pop it in the chat uh, at some stage. So let's now get on with the webinar itself. Each panelist, so we have a GP, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, they will give a short presentation specific to their discipline relating to the case. And then there'll be a period of questions and answers. And the questions are coming from you. The discussion, don't know how many answers, but discussion will be coming from the panelists. So I also wanted to mention the learning objectives for tonight and we as a panel have to make sure that we help you achieve those learning outcomes. Uh, I'll run through them very quickly. The first is to identify associations, comorbidities and patterns of treatment seeking behaviour of people who are experiencing social anxiety disorder and already some questions about that have popped up in the question area. We'll talk about tips and strategies that can assist someone who's experiencing the disorder and finally, we really want to talk about the importance of collaboration and appropriate referrals within the mental health professional network to make sure that people experiencing social anxiety disorder are appropriately supported. So that's what it's all about. And your evaluation you complete at the end will tell us whether we've achieved those outcomes or helped you achieve those outcomes throughout the webinar. Our first speaker is Caroline Johnson, who's going to talk to us from the GP perspective. As the case finishes up, really, Caroline, we could see that it would be likely that Anne-Marie might present to her doctor. Her husband, David, a policeman husband, has suggested she go along to the doctor for help uh, because he's concerned she's more quiet and anxious than usual. Uh, her husband's also worried about how much she's drinking lately. So she makes a 15-minute appointment and arrives on either Monday morning or Friday afternoon. How do you go about assisting her? Thanks, Steve. That's a pretty common scenario, isn't it, for um, a GP? 15 minutes to try and sort out something. If I'm lucky, I already know Anne-Marie pretty well, and I know already that you know David's a policeman and Bethany and Joshua, and I know them all, and so I've got a little bit of background. Um, but often with anxiety disorders in general and mental health problems more broadly, the real role of the GP is to engage the patient, to give them a bit of confidence that actually this is something they can get help for because if they're already embarrassed or particularly if she's already socially anxious, it might be quite difficult to even raise the problem. So that's the first thing is the patient has to be on side, the patient has to have a sense of hope. And then you really, even though you've only got a short period of time, you really do have to tease it out a little bit more to be sure that you're on the right track with the diagnosis. And so for my secondary and tertiary care colleagues, I think you have to forgive the GP occasionally that they give a more gen generic diagnosis that <coughs> the patient is anxious. Um, but of course, we should be encouraging the GP to dig down a bit deeper and make sure that they're on exploring that a little bit more because obviously there's a lot of comorbidity. You can have different types of anxiety or you can have anxiety and depression together as everyone here would know well. And then the third bit in that 15 minutes is really making sure the patient's safe. So we're at a webinar now called Social Anxiety Disorder, but when the person walks in the door, I don't know, you know, could this patient actually be depressed? Could they even be suicidal? Um, the issue of drinking and the husband encouraging her to come in might actually be a, a hidden way of something else going on, for example, intimate partner violence. So you can't really just jump to the conclusion that because someone says you're anxious that that's the only thing going on. 
Um, and of course, one really important tool to help GPs to kind of do that in a quick and efficient way is to think about the, you know, the five Ps. So go more into the presenting problem, find a bit more of a history about it, um, go into what, what predisposing factors, and there's a bit in this case study that kind of hints at things like, you know, she had a critical father and she likes you know, hobbies that are, you know, she can do in isolation. These kind of things are interesting. Um, but this is this formulation really helps us. And particularly early on as a GP, you should be looking at protective factors because they are often the things that will help you with the engagement when the going gets tough. Because to manage an anxiety disorder, you often have to face something that's quite difficult to face. So you need to be careful there that you've got some idea of the protective factors and you help the patient to bring them up. Um, the next thing that inevitably moves on is the patient saying, well, I've heard I can get a mental health treatment plan. And I must admit, in a 15-minute appointment, even if someone said they've heard they can see a psychologist, I try and slow things down a bit there because I have a, you know, lots of psychologists I work with and I find some of them are experts in some areas rather than others. And I personally find as a GP I get much better results if I match the patient with the right kind of therapist for their particular problem. So, for example, I have some psychologists who are really strong at delivering high-fidelity CBT and so if I've got someone who I really think is going to benefit from a traditional CBT intervention, I'll send them along. If I've got someone who I think there's more interpersonal problems, I have different psychologists I use for that. So the mental health treatment plan for me is really a tool for engagement. So what I do at the end of the 15 minutes is I say to this person, I can you know, help you to get help, um, but there's a little bit of things I'd like to, to, you to think about. I'd like to think what the goals are for you. So is the goal really to deal with your social anxiety disorder or is it just to you know, get your husband off your back or drink less alcohol because if the if you don't address the patient's goals, you won't get very far um, and treatment dropout will be high. I then ask the patient to, to think about those goals and write them down. I give them an outcome measure. In my practice, I use the K10, but I think there are other ones you can use. But for me, it's just one that I know is sensitive to change over time. So I get the patient to do that in their own time and bring it back. I give them some online resources I'd like them to look at just to prime them, to give them confidence that there's help out there. And if a patient's ready to, I often say, look, I'd love you to write down your life story, just one or two pages, even just in dot points, just to get a sense of the longitudinal nature of this story. You know, were you anxious as a child? Because not all people with social anxiety have it going back to childhood. Because I do think that can help you with the narrative and the, 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 you know, the, the engaging patient. This next slide just shows you an example of some of the resources I'd ask a patient to look at. So the Head to Health website, which has you know, well over 300 online resources for people with all kinds of problems. But again, it just normalises it and tells the patient that there's stuff out there that they can read. And sometimes that'll prompt the patient to ask other questions that they might not have been comfortable to ask the first time. Um, if the symptoms are mild and I've gotten on to the point where I think someone might have a specific diagnosis, I'll also refer them to e-mental health interventions. My experience in face-to-face -face practice is a lot of patients are a bit, bit reluctant to consider these, but when patients like them, they're absolutely brilliant. They really do make a difference and there's lots of evidence to support their use for the right selected patient at the right time. And particularly for my younger patients who are perhaps more IT literate, they're really good. Whether that would be appropriate for Anne-Marie is debatable, um, but I always think it's good to let people know that stuff's out there because they might dip in at a later date. And then the last thing I want to talk about is this issue of the mental health review. So this is really for all my psychologist colleagues out there. Um, I take the review of a mental health plan really seriously. Um, it's really frustrating when a patient rocks in six months later with another 15-minute appointment and says, I'd just like another referral and I've heard nothing from the therapist about what's happened or what their formulation is or whether there's anything else in the plan that I could reinforce. Whereas when I've got a letter back saying the person's come and seen me five or six times, four times, whatever, but this is the work we've done, these are the things I'm focusing on, that really enables me to use that review to really reinforce the right direction, reinforce the protective factors, reinforce that it's important to stick with the therapy because we know um, dealing with social anxiety disorder can be really difficult. That's why people often avoid situations that make them feel so uncomfortable. So again, just to flag, item 2712 is just one step in that process of creating this process where I, as the GP, will make sure the person keeps going with therapy, or if they fail at that, that they will keep coming back and try again in the future when they're ready. Thanks, I think Caroline. That's enough well, it is. I mean, it's great. If you can fit that much into your 15 minute uh, appointments, that explains a lot. It's interesting that Kirsty Edwards has asked the question about this, that how do you do all that within the 15 minutes? And obviously you do engage with the patient. I think a lot of people think that they don't see general practice as the continuum or the longitudinal interaction that we always seek it to be and that you're not always starting from a standing start. But 
it is frustrating, as you said, when you were seen as just a simple referral. And there's a temptation there for some GPs to just make it a simple referral rather than engaging. So you've obviously got to know Anne-Marie. You know about her in a situation. You've done your research and you know that really the best possible psychiatrist, you, or sorry, psychologist you can think of to write the mental health treatment plan to is Catherine. So uh, you refer... Anne-Marie to Catherine. Now, Catherine, what are you going to do when Anne-Marie comes through your door for the first time? Right. Okay, well, I suppose we want her to feel comfortable and um, obviously we want to get a history, but I suppose it's about sort of asking opening questions and trying to get um, her to speak so maybe we're not going to get the whole history in the first session, but, you know, it might take a couple of sessions to get all the background. Anyway, I like to give people some questionnaires to take home after the first session. So I've listed those there. So the lever we um, investigate the different social and performance scenarios and their degree of anxiety and avoidance. Um, I use David Clark's questionnaires, so that will give you a good idea of their safety behaviours, negative thoughts they experience in social interactions and how they feel about themselves. Obviously, we need to assess how depressed she is and if there's any risk. Uh, we need to get an idea of her alcohol intake and uh, whether she's self-medicating. Quite often, these people um, have some level of perfectionism, so it's good to have a look at that and, you know, check for other conditions such as OCD, DAD, and whether they've got any body image issues. Um, so we're going to work with Anne-Marie to come up with a formulation of the factors that are maintaining her social anxiety. Um, so obviously a major factor is the avoidance of social interaction. And, you know, she mentioned that, you know, she's done repeated exposure and it never gets any better but a lot of people don't realize they're engaging in safety behaviors so one of hers obviously is drinking so she's not really going to get the benefit out of you know her exposure um, if she keeps using alcohol as a crutch for example um, we also need to get her doing some attention training um, so that could be another reason why she hasn't improved so people with social anxiety are quite self-focused and they need to do attention training in order to learn how to focus externally. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, she's a bit of a perfectionist. So it could be that after a social event, um, she's criticising herself, focusing on what didn't go well rather than patting herself on the back for you know, the things that she did well. So um, stopping that post-event, um, post-mortem is important and trying to get across the idea to her that it's not about being perfect and it's okay to make mistakes, um, uh, stuff, uh, forget people's names. You know, the important thing is to get out there and interact with people. Um, if people are as severely anxious as she tends to be, I like to spend um, most of the sessions actually getting out there and doing some exposure work. So I find the easy part is getting people to read manuals or do some of the online programs that uh, Caroline suggested. Yeah, I think people can do the reading, but actually pushing them to go out and put the material into practice is the hard part. So we might go cafes, uh, go into shops and ask questions about products and services. I also encourage people to get involved in support groups. So in Victoria, we're lucky that there's quite a few um, not-for-profit support groups and that gives people a supportive place to practice what they're learning in sessions. Um, group therapy may also be a really good option for people and give the opportunity for people to get video feedback. Um, and we can encourage people to get involved in hobby and community groups. I 
I find that there's a lot of good um, CBT manuals on social anxiety and related topics such as self-esteem, perfectionism and self-compassion. Um, if people have just got mild social anxiety, I generally encourage them to start off just doing the CBT. Um, if their anxiety is maybe moderate and they're still finding things a bit difficult, maybe they would get some antidepressants from the GP. But if they're very severely depressed and extremely anxious, um, well, then I'd certainly be considering referring them back to GP for some medication if they're open to that. And I think we've only got 10 sessions under a mental health care plan. So although people can achieve a lot in 10 sessions, if someone's depressed, and, you know, they're not motivated, you know, it's certainly going to hamper their progress, so that needs to be kept in mind. And sometimes people will present for treatment and they're fearful of job interviews and they've got one the next day or they're going to have to give a wedding speech in a week. So if we have um, goals that can't be met in such a short time frame, um, you know, I might refer someone back to the GP for beta blockers because, you know, there's not going to be time to address the issues. I must say, Catherine, you've taken me back to first year medicine in 1979 when beta blockers had just been invented and one of my colleagues took one before an anatomy oral and had to do it all from the reclining position because his blood pressure dropped. <laughs> But I think what you're suggesting yeah. there is that there might be some short-term win, and it sounds to me like anne is using alcohol as her own self-medication. Uh, there's been questions asked about whether yeah. you would focus on the alcohol use or the social anxiety disorder in your approach, first of all. Um, a whole lot of things you could do, I suppose, in deciding what to do. But it sounds like you're in yeah. good communication with the referring GP, You've referred back to Caroline. Caroline's had another assessment and then thought that really the involvement of a psychiatrist would be appropriate at this stage. Again, she has her network of psychiatrists who she uses for different uh, referral reasons. We don't refer to specialists. We consult with specialists, so it's not a sending away. It's a team, team effort. And in this situation, Caroline's seen that Lisa's is the most appropriate person to work with uh, as part of the team for the treatment of Anne-Marie. So, Lisa, it's good to have you. We have acknowledged that your internet's a little bit wobbly where you are, so if we lose you, we lose you, but we've got you for now, and you've got Anne-Marie. So what are you going to do as priority one? Thanks. Well, my best priority is always to um, clarify the, the diagnosis. And when I'm you know, teaching the medical students, I always say, you know, keep an open mind start from scratch and do your own so um, GPs um, give you a, a, a variable amount of referral information um, you know ranging from I've had a chat to the GP on the phone to um, you know thanks for seeing this patient they'll tell you what the problem is um, so it, it's important to sort of start from, from scratch so um, I want to have in my own mind a hypothesis about why has this patient developed this problem at this time. And I think patients generally want to know that as well. So being a psychiatrist, I do like to look at the possible antecedents of the problem. Um, the interesting thing about anxiety is there's a very strong genetic vulnerability to anxiety, whereas depression is much more environmentally influenced. Um, in large measure, we inherit an anxiety-prone temperament uh, in the family. So that's often one of the biggest factors in why did this patient get anxiety. But there may well be other experiences they've had. Um, I also need that to help decide on the most appropriate treatment. And we, we've heard about the importance of formulation. I'll certainly echo that because that really is your treatment roadmap based on your diagnostic and treatment formulation. Important for me to identify potential comorbidities, and again, we've heard about the possibility that there might be a comorbid depression. That's very important to uh, identify. And with Anne Marie, we've seen there may be a hint of an obsessive compulsive personality style. We want to know about 
that too because it's going to have a, a bearing on how Amory engages with, with therapy and with therapists because perfectionism, as we've heard, could really interfere with treatment because um, you don't need to be perfect. You just need to be good enough to get by. And similarly, that applies in social situations. And I don't want to miss a disorder that better explains the presenting symptoms. And perhaps I'll just mention it can be sometimes difficult to distinguish between is this primarily a depression that has made the person very anxious or is it a primary anxiety disorder that has made the person rather depressed? And to me, it's the history that's most important. While not all anxiety disorders come on in the teens, most of them are preceded by being anxious person who, particularly with social anxiety, was quite shy, maybe always lacking in confidence, as is quite evident from this story. Whereas with somebody whose anxiety, social anxiety is secondary to a depression, I'm much more likely to hear a story like, I don't quite know what come over me, I'm just not myself, I don't normally worry about these sort of things, but over the past weeks or months, Things sort of happen. So I think it can be quite helpful to tease those things out. Um, so in this case, as I mentioned, I want to be really clear about personality style, um, major depression. Uh, it's always uh, important to bear in mind that people may have a history of complex trauma, which can really complicate therapy and also recovery. And clearly, we've got some issues around alcohol use in this case as well. Um, the next thing for me is the treatment-focused formulation, developing a model that I share with the patient to explain why the treatment symptoms occur in the first place. And perhaps even more importantly, given that all of us have anxiety from time to time, why in Anne-Marie's case did this become a disorder? Why has it kept going? And there's an intriguing reference in her case history to the fact that even though she pushes herself to confront social situations, it actually seems to be getting worse rather than better. But we really want to try and tease out what are the reinforcing factors for her anxiety, so why her symptoms have persisted. And it's very important to take account of behavioural responses, how do the important people in her life respond to her anxiety, what's going on in her environment that might be contributing to the picture. And I guess in addition to protective factors, I think it's really important to identify potential barriers yeah. to treatment up front so that you and the patient can work together to try to think about how you're going to address those barriers. So we want to share that formulation, get the patient's input and ask her to share it with important others in her life. Do they agree? What else would they add to that model? And then the provision of psychoeducation, which um, is often very well done in general practice. And because Anne-Marie was seen a psychologist at this stage, she will also have had very good quality um, psychoeducation. But I do like to introduce them to the flight or fight model. They haven't uh, heard about that before. What is social anxiety disorder? What causes it? What do you need to do to get over it? And then really the treatment, um, evidence-based treatment options in detail. Um, what is CBT? What should it look like if you're really getting CBT that shows fidelity to what the evidence says works? And what about pharmacotherapeutic options? And really, my rule of thumb, and it's echoed by the clinical practice guidelines, is if a patient needs medication for more than a few days, then it should be an antidepressant. So there's a very limited role for benzodiazepines. And really with beta blockers, I'd also exercise great caution in using them because they could easily start to be used in a kind of PRN basis. And the evidence is very clear that generalised social anxiety disorder, beta blockers are not better than placebo. I think that there's a, a tendency for them to be overused um, sometimes in both special and primary care, I think. Um, and of course it's up to the patient in terms of treatment they would prefer um, I'll just finish with the, a couple of diagrams that are actually taken from the clinical guidelines um, 
for anxiety and they, they take account um, what typically happens in general practice. Um, GPs do a magnificent job because people walk in the door um, with some mixture of physical, psychological and probably social and cultural problems and GPs have to kind of work out is this something that's going to get better by itself? Is this something I need to intervene for? So our guidelines recommend, obviously, a good assessment, but then a kind of watchful waiting. Um, give the patient psychoeducation, some general advice not to avoid things. Things don't get better. Let's have another look at it. So if symptoms have shifted or gotten worse, then let's look at an initial treatment. And basically, we recommend that that chosen based on the severity of the presenting symptom. So we recommend cognitive behavioural therapy as first-line treatment for mild symptoms. And by mild, we mean symptoms that perhaps are not overly impairing or distressing. For moderate or uh, level of social anxiety, then in fact, there's a choice that can be discussed with the patient. So we recommend monotherapy is usually enough, CBT or medication, but you could use both if you wanted. And as we've heard, when it's more severe or when there's a comorbid depression, then we would want to uh, combine those two treatments. So I guess that, those are the sorts of things I'd, I'd be looking at. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa. There were some issues with your microphone, so we managed to string the things together. We've understood everything you said and the, the staff are going to talk to you about how we might be able to improve that. Okay. But there are so many questions and I guess we'll focus on Caroline and Catherine first of all. People have been asking about what about earlier? Now we have Anne-Marie at 47. What about when she was back at school? In the case we've seen a whole lot of things about her, uh, having a very strict parent, uh, being anxious at school, not feeling comfortable, uh, being very sensitive to criticism which seemed to come her way. Could anything have been done then, do you think, um, Caroline or, or Catherine um, particularly? Ka uh, Catherine? Well, we know from research that um, I think 40% of cases start before the age of 10 and I think it's 90% of people would start experiencing it before the age of 18. I read that in one study. Um, so certainly if people find that their child is being a bit, um, you know, I suppose, you know, selective mutism, um, not um, reporting, not having friends to play with at school, um, perhaps being hesitant to raise their hand in class, um, you know, being anxious about show and tell, um, you know, you would think that, the primary teachers would be observing these things and you'd hope that they'd be feeding that back to parents. Um, and I suppose teachers sort of know what's an average performance at school, so you would hope that the teacher might refer to the school psychologist or perhaps have a word to the parents about, you know, whether they think the child needs some assistance. And Catherine, are there any other therapy types that could be used at that stage rather than going straight to CBT? Is there anything else that might work well in a an adolescent, perhaps? Sorry, on an adolescent? Well, yeah, when we're talking about here with Anne-Marie, we've talked about CBT, we've talked a bit about medication. People are asking questions about maybe other sorts of psychological interventions that might be evidence-based but still useful at this stage if we're still back in the early the early days. Well, I, I suppose in childhood, um, you know, there are good storybooks parents can read to children that might be sort of fostering ideas, you know, um, consistent with the CBT approach, but, you know, through some storybooks. Um, there's a psychologist, John Loof, at the University of Armadale, and he had a shy child. And he's actually put resources on the internet. So if you type in John Malouf, M-A-L-O-U-F-F, uh, shy children, he talks about all the things that he did with his young daughter. So people might find that a helpful resource. Okay. Caroline, can I chip in there, Steve? 
Yeah, sure, Caroline. What did you want to say? Oh, just I think that um, one of the great things about being in general practice is you often um, see parents interacting with their children when they come in for all kinds of things like immunisations or when they've got coughs and colds. And it is an opportunity to observe and notice like if you've got a very strict parent or someone who's very harsh and you can sometimes try and role model and say, oh, you know, that's interesting how you cope that way. And sometimes you can make some little you know, hints to get under people's skin to sort of think about the way they do it. And I think this is where... Um, Certainly early childhood teachers, kindergarten teachers and these things are really important and I've been very impressed with the kindergarten teachers. I know that they often do teach sort of cognitive and behavioural strategies from a very early age and so getting parents to talk about those things, things they've noticed that help reduce um, stress and worry for children in general I think can really help and that just normalises the conversation so that then if a child does seem to be more than shy and be unduly anxious or avoiding things, it just makes it much easier for people to talk about getting help rather rather than kind of making it too much of a medical problem. I think that's really important because it, I think it scares parents away if they think their child's got a problem and they're going to end up on some sort of merry-go-round of, of medicalisation and even medication. It's really important to reassure people that there are lots of things that can be done before you get to that point. Absolutely. And this takes us back to the very beginning, I guess, where we talked about the risk of um, medicalising what might just be shyness. It's clearly not in this case. Lots of questions being asked about other diagnoses and even in the questions that were submitted before the webinar, questions about what about uh, autism spectrum disorder, high function autism, avoidant personality, post-trauma, um, generalised anxiety disorder. Lisa, you are putting up a valiant effort by holding a phone to your ear for the next um, 45 minutes or thereabouts. <laughs> uh, we better give you a chance to talk. What do you think about the diagnosis? Uh, is there a risk of us missing some of those other conditions at this stage? Well, I think that's really the reason for a very careful assessment, particularly in someone who's not responding the way you've expected them to. So I think, you know, up to now, all the steps have been absolutely right. we made the diagnosis of social anxiety disorder, GP's referred for a psychologist, but let's say you know, the patient doesn't seem to be making much progress or, or whatever, and maybe that's when we want to just go back and let's just have another look at things and are we missing something something else. Um, certainly with high-functioning autism, you, you can get some social anxiety, but normally you will pick up that there is a, a misreading of social cues and that the person doesn't interact. It's not a pure anxiety that's happening in the interaction um, and there may be some distress around things going wrong but when you explore it, it's more around misreading cues. Um, people with social anxiety are generally um, acutely uh, aware of social cues and if anything they they tend to err on the side of interpreting them as being critical um, and they're often hypersensitive to the the needs of others so in practice I, I don't I think you can tease those um, apart reasonably well um, it can be harder to tease out avoidant personality disorder because they can of course coexist um, the way I think about it is the person who just has a social anxiety disorder says, look, um, if only I could get over my social anxiety problem, people would see that I have a lot to offer. Whereas the person with avoidant personality disorder almost has the reverse problem. They actually worry that if they got to know people better, then people would see that deep down they don't have anything to offer. They're somehow inferior or worthless. So they have a often crippling low sense of self-esteem which which is as a therapist it, it you know your counter-transference is it makes you just terribly sad because you see this really interesting worthwhile very nice person who just has an absolute rock bottom self-esteem and it's their intense fear of rejection that's contributing to their social anxiety. So they're going to need much longer-term therapy. Um, Ten sessions with CBT is, is unlikely to, to cut it for them. Um, in terms of trauma, again, it's unlikely to be just a post-traumatic stress disorder, but it may well be... <clears throat> excuse me, now my voice is going, let alone the technology. It may well be um, that this person has a history of complex trauma 
which is really complicating the picture. And I think that is something that we need to be alert for generally. Thanks for that. And clearly a lot of the questions we had before the webinar were about the impact of this COVID pandemic on people with social anxiety disorder. This must be hellishly difficult. Do any of you want to talk about what you see or what you're seeing at the moment in your practices about people who may have the disorder that are also trying to cope with the impact of the COVID pandemic, which may actually not be all bad, but there's a return to society at some stage, I suppose. Does anybody have any comments about that? Yeah, well, I can comment. Well, I've I've seen a few... Catherine and then Caroline. Oh, well, I've certainly found that people are reporting sort of relapsing and going backwards because they're losing confidence. And obviously, many people are not going to university or school. Um, single people may be living alone. Um, they're not having that interaction at work. So a lot of people are finding it very difficult. And I think some people are that scared to go out now. Um, they're only going to the supermarket maybe once a week. Um, so I've been encouraging people to try to get out every day, go to the supermarket, get a takeaway coffee, get some takeaway food and just try to have little interactions that are available in terms of, you know, talking to your shop assistants and baristas because that's about all you can do at this point, maybe catch up. If you've got a friend that lives local and goes for a walk, there's not that many avenues that people have left. No, Maybe true. talk about, to people on Zoom. Like this works well. Yeah. What about what about you, Caroline? What what did you want to offer? I just think it's interesting. I've seen some people with social anxiety disorder who think the pandemic's great because they don't have to face their anxiety. But I certainly I spoke to someone just today who, you know, really his therapy stalled because he can't really do the behavioural experiments that he'd been set up to do by his psychologist and so he's not ready to engage. The other thing I find really interesting is some people really want face-to-face, -face, even though you give them the option of video or, or telephone. I mean, I'm not so keen on telephone. I much prefer video. But I kind of assume that patients with social anxiety would prefer um, telephone to video. But interestingly, some of them actually said, no, I really want to come in face-to-face. -face. So we've had to kind of deal with how to do that safely because obviously having people in your room for longer periods of time at the height of the pandemic has risks. Um, but I think it's just a case-by-case. -case. Everybody's a bit different about how they deal with that. Thanks for that. And before you go, what about uh, a question from Belinda Mitten connell who was asking about, OK, what if you had somebody who you made the diagnosis? Would you be confident to write on a Centrelink form that they don't have to attend uh, work interviews and things like that? Are you confident enough in the diagnosis of social anxiety disorder that you could make a statement on a legal document? Um, the answer is it depends, but yes, I think GPs are well trained to make diagnoses of psychiatric illnesses if we're going down that path. But I think one of the problems is as GPs we're often not allowed to on Centrelink do certain things and there's a real problem in the way Centrelink interacts with GPs. Um, but I think there are many patients who I think I feel comfortable and the point of having psychologists and psychiatric colleagues is they're the people I refer to when the diagnosis isn't clear. Um, but in some cases it's very clear. Um, I have whole families of people with social anxiety I treat because it's such a you know strongly genetically inherited condition so I meet one family member and then over a course of maybe three or four or five years I eventually meet other family members who also have social anxiety disorder and I think it's pretty straightforward then to make the diagnosis and I would feel very comfortable in those situations but my framing of it is always is it good for someone to avoid something because they've got social anxiety disorder can we work around it and actually help them to not need to avoid things because that's one of the problems with the whole notion of um, disability that you know sometimes you use that as an excuse not to challenge yourself to move on and that really means you have to have a very good relationship and be very well well engaged with a patient so they trust you enough to push them out of their comfort zone and that's where Centrelink often doesn't help because Centrelink's often very black and white about either you're fit or you're not fit which is really not helpful for people who are struggling with trying to you know get a return of function from an anxiety disorder. Any other comments from the panelists? Uh, about COVID, Steve, or...? <laughs> well, yeah, about COVID, or, yeah, in particular... Oh, look, COVID. I mean, I'd, I'd echo what, what Carolyn said. Um, we've seen people where it, it probably meant that they've engaged with therapy when they might not have otherwise. So I think for some people with social anxiety beginning therapy, it removed 
a lot of the anxiety about actually getting out and coming to appointments and, and we've had some quite enthusiastic uptake of, of telehealth. But then again, as Catherine said, I think, and in fact Carolyn as well, then when it comes time to now it's important to go out and start doing your exposure, it, it has created some challenges um, at that stage. But I think at least in social anxiety, I think overall it hasn't been entirely a bad thing in terms of us being able to engage people in therapy. Okay, thanks for that. And also while I've got you, uh, people have been asking about why this might be emerging in Anne-Marie at this stage. She's 47. This has obviously been going on for some time. Is there anything you can think of that might be triggering for her or that's bringing it out? Um, look, I'd just say that it's not emerging now. Um, it's something that she's um, accommodated, I think, for a long time in her life. If you actually read her um, her history, there's lots of things that she hasn't done right through her life because of her social anxiety. So she's really been um, impaired. I mean, I think her social anxiety has stopped her living the life she might have liked to um, have lived. Um it may be that she's now become, um, the fact that she's become depressed on top of it, or maybe she's just become demoralised because, you know, like maybe her husband's been doing more social functions, so she's been pushing herself more. I mean, I can't imagine how dispiriting it must be to force yourself to go out and confront situations and find that not only are you not getting better, but you seem to be getting worse. And I think, um, you know, Catherine's, um, people might not realise it, but a lot of what Catherine spoke about identifies some of the reasoning for that, which is, you know, when people go home and just play over and over in their mind how how much of a fool they made of themselves, then you can understand why instead of having an experience of mastery, people get an experience of failure because of, of the message they're getting themselves. So I think we frequently see exacerbations, but what we do know about social anxiety disorder it it is a chronic disorder. Of all the anxiety disorders, it is one of the least likely to undergo spontaneous remission. But it can certainly have periods of relative exacerbation or, you know, or becoming a bit less uh, less severe. Mm. Thanks, Lad. And a few people have been asking about menopause. Uh, Caroline, would you do a, a workup? On Anne Marie at this stage. To yeah, so I was, I was just going to throw in there. I certainly, I certainly think one of the things I find helpful as a GP is to always ask why is this person in the room right now. And in my experience, periods of of transition are common times that people present more with symptoms. So in Anne Marie's case, that could be just a role transition issue. Like you know, if your children are leaving home and you suddenly do. You know, your husband's thinking we're going to have more social engagements now and you're not going to be as busy raising the family. Therefore, you know, that might be a reason for, you know, change, role transition. But then there's also the biological changes that happen in the perimenopause. And I certainly find it's very, and I, I, I personally think it's because at that time your estrogen levels might be dropping, you might be getting irregular menstrual cycle, you might be getting um, more aches and pains because of estrogen deficiency. There's all these biological changes happening in your body and so insomnia, for example, is really common around the perimenopause. 47, I think, is a little bit young for that, but certainly some women do start experiencing perimenopausal symptoms from their early 40s. So I always ask a few questions about that. And then I also make sure that we're not missing any other physical causes. In my 20-year career, I've met a few people who I thought had well-established social anxiety disorder who actually had also developed thyrotoxicosis. It's not common, but it's really embarrassing if you miss. So the common ones would be making sure someone doesn't have an organic thing like anemia or thyrotoxicosis. With regard to perimenopause, I don't tend to do a whole lot of tests. I rely on the history. So if a person's getting irregular periods, hot flushes, insomnia, then I think, well, that, that could be an element, but I don't think blood tests are actually all that helpful because really your hormone levels depend on the day you do the test. And I know a lot of people do push for that, but I actually don't think it's that clinically useful. It's the history that's more important. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Any other comments from the from the, the group? Um, yeah, Lisa here. I would just yes, add sir. that um, what we know about social anxiety, uh, I mean, the, the thing that's always been fascinating to me is um, obviously you can have a range of symptoms when you get highly anxious from you know from head to toe, um, but there are patterns in what symptoms bother people the most. And in social anxiety, it's the symptoms that are most visible to other people. So typically, sweating, shaking, and blushing. 
And if you think about menopause, um, menopausal symptoms include flushing, um, sweating. So it, you could understand why you might get an exacerbation um, around the perimenopause because those sort of symptoms um, might spell anxiety to, to other people um, in, in that person's mind. So, you know, that could be another reason why um, it, it could, you could see an exacerbation. Thanks for that. Now, Caroline, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. You're practicing in the leafy green suburbs of Melbourne, but there are others who are obviously working in areas without such a supply of therapists as there might be in a city the size of Melbourne or the other capitals. I was wondering what the people, what the team think about referring to other people in your area who might not be of a particular disciplinary background, but who you know have either a lived experience or some other skill set such as art therapy or something that might actually be part of the solution for somebody. Has anybody had an experience working with other people they know would have a particular benefit for a, a client? Well, so I certainly have, not so much though for social anxiety disorder. So I certainly have people with more complex mental health conditions who I use the peer workforce, which is an emerging workforce, but probably more in the group of patients who have more complex mental health issues. And I certainly think they're not widely accessible, unfortunately. But I also work a lot with um, mental health social workers, occupational therapists, mental health nurses. They all become part of the landscape. But if we're, if we're sticking to the topic of social anxiety disorder, if someone hasn't had an evidence-based treatment for the condition that I've diagnosed them, I try and make sure they've at least had that with the, with the understanding that if, if you have that, in, like if you have say CBT for this with exposure therapy and it doesn't work, then I'd start thinking a bit more creatively of have I missed something or is this more complex and needs a, a broader group. The problem for patients is it's expensive. So um, while a lot of GPs will bulk bill patients with mental health problems, many of our colleagues won't and that's fine that's a understandable you know it's a it's a decision to you know if you're making a living but if you say to a patient well here's three or four other people you could see most patients will balk at the cost and that's very hard for us in general practice to to actually access affordable even in the leaf eastern suburbs when you say to someone that you know you might have to spend a hundred dollars out of pocket to see a psychologist for you know up to 10 visits that's quite a big imposition i would argue that it's a great investment but you have to get people to balance that especially if you're asking them to do something that makes them feel uncomfortable like deal with social anxiety yep no fair comment any other comments from the group before we move on to another question one thing that's oh, come just up with enough... um, Anne Marie, um yes, i think quite often when people have young children, they can use the children as a bit of a barrier between them and the world, and the children can sort of engage in some of the social interactions. And then, I mean, the children get older and aren't available. They've lost, you know, a major source of company. Um, well, it's interesting in Anne Marie's case, of course, her children were also her major source of friends through the school. And she's obviously yeah. lost that connection as well. So she's pretty lonely in her in her house, isn't she? Mm. Alcohol. <laughs> uh, it's not a suggestion. This is the whole thing, obviously, that alcohol has taken on such a prominence at the moment. What do people think about alcohol in somebody with social anxiety disorder? Is it seen? Is use seen more frequently? Is that chicken or egg? What What does the panel think? Well, that is the most likely substance to be abused because um, alcohol is so socially acceptable. If you go along to a social uh, gathering or situation where people are having a drink, you can have a drink too. It is uh, anxiolytic, at least to start with, and it's going to look quite normal to, to kind of have that drink. And so, of course, um, people can start to uh, rely on it. So it is interesting that you do find in groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous, you have quite, often quite high rates of social anxiety disorder um, in amongst those groups. So it, it does seem to be a substance that um, probably is um, more likely to be used in, in problematic ways uh, than, say, other substances. For example, most anxious patients don't go around using stimulants um, at all, so uh, we don't see many problems with that. But alcohol, and if they've been prescribed benzodiazepines in some type of PRN way, then that can 
become a problem as well, which is, again, why, as a general rule, we don't like medication use PRN for anxiety um, because then when people cope with the situation, they haven't really mastered it. They attribute it to the medication and they're not going to get any sort of extinction of their fear. So, And alcohol is going to work that way as well. Thanks for that. Catherine, back to you. A number of people are asking about attention training. I must say I'm intrigued by it as well. What does that actually involve and how does it help people with social anxiety disorder? Right. Oh, well, if people go onto YouTube and if you type in attention training, um, you can find a couple of tracks by somebody called Joel Dames, D-A-M-E-F, and you can also find, um, I think it's this psychologist, Adrian Wells, talking about attention training. And yeah, There's quite a lot of information that you can get even on YouTube. But perhaps if we explain why attention training, because we know that in social anxiety, people are too self-focused, as, um, as Catherine mentioned before. So their attention is often on themselves and constructing a picture in their own minds of how other people are probably seeing them. So it's no wonder that that becomes, it becomes very hard to maintain a conversation when at the same time you're trying to imagine how you're coming across to other people. So part of that attention training is about training people to keep their attention focused externally. Would that be a fair comment, Catherine? Yeah, and I think when when people are very self-focused, um, they're so busy, trapped in their head, worrying about what other people are thinking and paying attention to their anxiety symptoms, um, that they can't actually take on board that perhaps the other person is responding favourably to them. So they're missing out on um, some social cues that might correct their sort of negative beliefs and assumptions because they're just too tapped into their worries and their physical symptoms. In fact, there's yeah, a so very if, um, if you go oh, on sorry. YouTube, um, there's, there's quite a few attention training tracks that go for maybe five or ten minutes and you get your client to do maybe ten minutes twice a day. Um, I think it's been recommended that they do it maybe for two months. And then that gets them much better at listening to other people. And if you're intently listening and focusing, well, that's diverting you from paying attention to your physical symptoms and your negative thoughts. And I was going to add that there's some interesting research that shows that even that one piece of advice to keep their attention focused externally rather than internally has been shown to be... Um, very beneficial in terms of yeah. overcoming their their social anxiety. That sounds sounds fabulous. Can we do in the last five minutes before we we sum up? I just was wondering if we could talk about specific groups, about uh, maybe people from um, uh, different cultures and linguistic backgrounds. Any thoughts about how have any of you worked with people from different groups like that, and if, has it changed your approach at all? Have you observed well, anything specific, I guess? Well, um, uh, you know, you need, to, you need to find out what they're aiming for. So what is culturally appropriate interaction that that person is, is actually, um, you know, what are their goals? So I think that's, that's the first thing. We have to be careful about making assumptions that, um, you know, as to what, what we're aiming for, I guess, with any treatment or, or what, what the person sees as the problem because obviously there are different cultural norms in terms of different styles of social interaction so that would be and I'd just be I'd explore that with the patient um, which is something we're doing anyway you know what what is this person's what are their goals okay and older people as well anything specific that any of you do with older older people with this condition beyond 47 obviously into the 70s or 80s well i i generally find that um the average age of people that come in is about 30 um and that's 
tends to be the age at which people sort of tend to surface for treatment. I find it pretty rare that um, people say 60 or 70 would come in. Um, Carol, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't find it rare for people to surface at 50. I don't get that many. They mainly tend to be sort of in that late 20s, 30 sort of bracket. And in fact, it should raise suspicion that depression is really the primary disorder. Um, it, it's extremely rare for people to present with a first presentation of anxiety in that older age group. Um, but I, I agree with Catherine. I think even really an older person, it is unusual for us to see them presenting for treatment for social anxiety for the first time. So a loss of confidence, a kind of anxiety around people. Are we missing a depression here? Okay, what about the people around Anne-Marie and people like her? Do you have any thoughts about supports for the partners of people with social anxiety disorder or the children of a, of a person or the parents of a child or a teenager with well, social anxiety disorder? Well, it sounds awful. But yeah, I, go on. I think some of these things have to be a bit cruel to be kind. One of my brothers, he was, I don't know if you'd say socially anxious, but certainly a shy child. And I remember when he was maybe kinder or prep, um, my father would not buy him any lollies at the milk bar. And if he wanted a Freddo frog, my father would hand him the money and say, well, if you want it, you're going to have to buy it yourself. So, you know, he got a lot of 20 pieces. He had a lot of Freddo frogs. And once he could get that Freddo at the milk bar, then it was taken up a notch. And look, my father was not a psychologically minded person. So it was just pure exposure and Fredo frogs and 20 cent pieces. And years later, my brother became um, a politician. So, um, it, you know, it goes I... to show you that um, if you push, <laughs> you may still be a bit shy, but if you get that push, you will succeed but people have to encourage you and you know quite strongly push you out of your comfort zone I'm sorry Catherine that was a joke that I was going to make and I thought that I wouldn't make it but it's actually true I hope he hasn't got diabetes from all those chocolate frocks as well but there you go. <laughs> well, great story let's now just um, start moving towards we finished at 8 30 10 minutes to go on this side of the continent I'm just wondering, uh, Caroline, what do you see as the future for Amory when she comes back to you after having spent time with Catherine and with Lisa and maybe with other peer supports, other therapists, social work, whatever it might be that you're able to find for her? Do you think she's got uh, a positive way forward? Look, I certainly think she's got a much more positive way forward by having sought help, but I don't think it's always a quick fix. I do find many of these patients come back and say it was too difficult and that's certainly when we have a conversation about medication. The good news is I find the patients who are still engaged um, and are willing to try do respond very well to SSRIs in this situation and sometimes that's the extra step that enables them to re-engage with the therapy that they found too difficult. Um, I don't want to paint that that's what always happens but certainly I think when you're dealing with someone who's older who's had the symptoms for a very long time that can be difficult. And then there's always the tension of how much you go into the background of the hypercritical father. I could see some questions coming through in the question manager of, you know, how much of this is dealing with the here and now and the symptoms you've got now versus opening up that can of worms about your background. And again, some people find one pathway more helpful than the others. And therefore, sometimes you have to switch therapists midstream. You know, if, if, if they've reached closure with one type of therapy, then you have to say, well, is this something you'd like to explore more? Um, and that, that is tricky in general practice because, again, it means a bigger commitment of time and, and more cost for the patient. And there's not always certainty about how much extra benefit they'll get from doing those things. And so sometimes people then say, well, it's easier just to retreat back into my old way of doing things, which is to stay more at home and to go out on social engagements less. So you really need, you need that impetus of I need to change. There has to be something else in the patient's life that, that pushes them. Yeah, it's such an important a principle though, not to stick with the one, the one treatment, but to, to change. It's appropriate. Absolutely. Sorry. So who was that? That was... 
Was There's Lisa, a good right? story on the internet oh, okay. about the psychologist Albert Ellis. Um, so if you Google Albert Ellis and dating anxiety, when he was 18 or 19, he was cripplingly anxious around women and he also feared public speaking and he fixed both of these social phobias in the space of two months. But if you read the story about how much effort he put into it, he spoke to 120 women in a month. And when I see people, I like to show them this article about Albert Ellis because I say, you know, this man was extremely anxious, but look at how hard he worked to get over it. So he got a fantastic result in two months. But, you know, I say to people, well, if he spoke to 120 women in a month when he was fearful of chatting to women, you know, that shows you his commitment to getting out of his comfort zone. So, you know, I try to encourage people, it's not that you can't do it, but how hard are we going to work um, to get that result? And he, he made that fantastic um, progress decades ago when we didn't know as much about social anxiety as we do now, all he knew was that he had to expose himself to his fears. That's all he knew. He didn't have the help of a psychologist. There weren't all these resources. He didn't do any attention training. All he knew was he'd have to go and talk to women. But he did also, he was actually a big fan of Stoic philosophy. So he also had that philosophy that... Um, it's the way you think about things that makes yep. them problematic. So he, he actually combined exposure and thinking. I'm going to be lying awake tonight thinking 120 people. <laughs> That's exhausting. That's absolutely exhausting. But it's interesting. But it's how an amazing effort. So that beautifully. Uh, a lot of these principles have very ancient roots, don't they, in just solid uh, thinking and philosophy. What about you, Lisa? Anything you wanted to finish up on before we, we wrap up for the evening? And then back to Catherine. Look, it, it's a very treatable uh, disorder, but it's quite a complex disorder because, and I think all those little aspects of cognitive uh, training, like attention refocusing and not doing what we call post-event processing, are terribly important. And the reason is this. If you have a panic disorder with agoraphobia, your fear is typically that you're going to have a panic attack and, you know, drop dead or have a stroke or something. So if you can persuade people to, you know, drive across the Harbour Bridge or catch an express train or whatever it might be, and they arrive alive uh, at the other side, then it's clear that their, their feared outcome hasn't happened. But you see, social anxiety, social situations are so much more ambiguous. We never know for sure what people are thinking. So there has to be this, I think, extra layer of work at deciding that embarrassing yourself is just not the worst thing that can happen to you. And, you know, not being so focused on yourself, being prepared to be sort of good enough. So I think for a good going social anxiety disorder, you probably do need quite sophisticated psychological help um, to get over it, I think. And um, But that is such a good investment because the other thing we know about CBT in particular is that the effects last. Um, once you kind of get better, you can stay better. So I really encourage people to um, engage in in CBT. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for tonight. You've really given us a lot to think about. The chat box has been um, vibrant, I think is probably a good way to put it. Lots of questions we didn't get to, but I think we got to bits and pieces of most of them, and uh, hopefully people feel that we've achieved something tonight from the conversation. I've certainly learned a massive amount. We're now just going to do the wrap-up. Uh, one thing we really do look for, and please do complete the exit survey, give some feedback on what's been useful tonight. There's a survey icon at the top of the screen, the top right of the screen. Click on that. Very quick survey to fill out, or otherwise it'll pop up when we finish. The next webinar is going to be held in September. Uh, oh, sorry, no, this Wednesday, this one coming. Primary care, of course. Older persons and mental health. So please, if you can attend the one this Wednesday, and then a really important one again, the 22nd of September. All these topics are just fantastic. Treating mental health professionals, which is one of the great challenges. 
Uh, so Treaty Mental Health Professionals, 22nd of September. I just wanted to remind you that Mental Health Professional Network supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners to share tips and resources, build local referral pathways and engage in CPD activities like this. So due to the current environment, most MHPN networks have been postponed, although some are organising Zoom meetings. So please contact your local coordinator or the central MHPN office. So to learn more about joining your local practitioner network and special interest groups, contact MHPN or go to the news section of the website. You can also indicate your interest in the exit survey, which if you haven't pushed that button, please push the button or it will pop up at the end. So before I close, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people, many of whom are with us tonight, who have lived with mental illness in the past and who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you all the people online. Thank you to Catherine and Caroline and Lisa for speaking with us this evening and to everybody for participating. We now have time to go and relax with family, hopefully, uh, or friends, or to have a chat and look after each other. Stay well and thank you all. Good night.